I read the entire Jujutsu Kaisen manga, all of the fan book, Shonen Jump specials, extra material, several different interviews, and many obscure references to bring you everything you didn't know about Satoru Gojo. The kanji for Satoru in Gojo's name can be translated as Enlightener, while the kanji for Gojo can be translated as Enlightenment. When creating the series, author Gege Akutami wanted to create a character that was similar to Zaraki Kenpachi from Bleach, but because Gojo didn't fit the bill, he made Toto instead. Even with that being the case, when creating Gojo, Gege Akutami wanted to create a pinnacle of strength that wasn't overly complicated, and that was certainly accomplished with Gojo's character. Gojo is also listed as not not having any special skills because he can do practically anything that he attempts. As for the references behind Gojo's character, Jujutsu Kaisen is a series that's heavily inspired by Buddhism. From the Culling Games, sharing themes of samsara, the cycle of life, suffering, death, and rebirth, the intricate lore behind domain expansions, themes of enlightenment, and Gojo is no different. Gojo in many ways can be viewed as a depiction of the Buddhist pantheon Fudo Miyo, a chief of the five wisdom kings, the wrathful avatar of the Dainichi Buddha and the tenacious protector of Buddhist law. Fudo Mio is described as having a body that's black and blue, very similar to Gojo's uniform as a sorcerer, with bulging eyes, which Gojo depicts as well. Fudo Mio is known for frightening people into accepting the teachings of the Dainichi Buddha, while carrying the devil subduing sword in his right hand, which is depicted by the inverted spear of heaven, which Gojo either seals or destroys after his fight with Toji, according to Tengen, while having a rope in his left hand for catching and binding demons or obstacles to awakening, which is depicted by the black rope that Gojo encounters when fighting Miguel in the Night Parade of 100 Demons, both of which Gojo either exhausted or completely got rid of after being opposed with them in his past. Gojo has visual references throughout the series that tie him to Fudo Mio as well, such as both Fudo and Gojo making threatening gestures with their index fingers, pointing threatening gestures towards the earth, and of course, Gojo's famous quote about his own enlightenment. Fudo is also known for being all-seeing due to the third eye in his forehead, much like Gojo's very very intricate view of the world due to having the six eyes, where he can see through bodies and curse techniques even while blindfolded or wearing sunglasses that no human being should be able to see out of, according to the author of the series. Gojo was born on December 7th, 1989, already having the six eyes at birth. When Gojo grew a bit older, while still being a child, he already had a bounty of 100 million yen on his head, which assassins went out to collect quickly and quickly backed out after seeing how strong he was, where it's revealed that Gojo simply being alive was enough for the cursed spirits in Japan to start getting stronger in order to not die by his hands, although he ultimately became stronger than them anyway, causing the assassins that tried to hunt him down initially to say that Gojo's birth changed the balance of the world, where even over a decade later, they would go into hiding until he was sealed, saying that if he was still free, then they never would have come out of the shadows, presumably until the day he died. These assassins made their money as curse users for hire, yet they they weren't able to thrive the way that they once did due to hiding from Gojo for over 10 years, meaning that Gojo basically took away their livelihood by walking around and breathing because he could kill them at any moment if he wanted to. Gege Akutami actually points out in the fan book that with each passing year leading up to Gojo's birth, the activity of cursed spirits increased and curse users enjoyed their freedom. But that increase in cursed spirit and curse user activity stopped with the birth of Gojo. Gojo and Toji actually met when they were younger and Gojo was the only person that ever sensed Toji's presence when Toji stood behind him something that Toji would remember years later when hunting down Gojo on a mission. Given that Toji left the Zenin clan at a young age and is wearing a similar outfit to the one that Naoya saw him in during Naoya's flashback in his first fight against Maki, it's possible that Gojo met Toji before he fully left the Zenin clan altogether. Given that Gojo and Naoya are one year apart in age and look like they're at similar ages in both of these flashbacks, the similarities between both of these scenes lends to this possibly being true. When becoming a student at Jujutsu High, Gojo was automatically accepted due to his family lineage, although much isn't known about the Gojo clan, as Gojo is essentially a one-man army, the head of the clan, and the sole representative. By the time Gojo is first seen as a student at Jujutsu High, he's already in his second year as a student, being sent on missions with Suguru and Shoko to save Grade 2 Sorcerer Utahime Iori and Grade 1 Sorcerer Mei. After making fun of Utahime for needing to be rescued, Utahime tells Gojo to respect 
respect his seniors, which doesn't matter to Gojo at all. After that, according to series author Gege Akutami, Utahime's annoyance with Gojo became a reflex, with Gojo still being the main cause of her stress a decade later. Interestingly enough, at this point in time, Gojo believes that Mei, as a grade 1 sorcerer, is strong. By the time Gojo as a second year student is revealed, he has both the six eyes, which he was born with, and his curse technique, Limitless. With Gojo being marked as a rare prodigy, on top of the techniques that he was born with. When Gojo rescued Utahime in May, after they were trapped for two days, he destroyed the building they were in with Azure Glow, but he left the assistant director behind and didn't use a curtain, so the explosion that he caused ended up on the news. The reason this annoyed Principal Yaga is because of a rule that exists within the ranks of Jujutsu sorcerers, where sorcerers aren't meant to reveal the existence of cursed techniques, cursed spirits, or cursed objects to non-curse users. Although it's never shown that anyone directly saw what Gojo did, the aftermath of the explosion from his technique being made public made for coming dangerously close to that happening. It's also worth noting that Jujutsu sorcerers are paid for their missions, meaning that Mei and Utahime were compensated for the mission that Gojo saved them from, but Gojo, being a student, was not. When questioning why curtains are necessary, the rhetoric that Gojo chastises Suguru for blurting out is a reiteration of the same rules that were mentioned before, where the very first one says that the mission of Jujutsu sorcerers is to maintain the peace and safety of society by preventing calamities from cursed techniques, cursed spirits, and cursed objects. Satsuru, as a member of the Gojo family, would be more familiar with these rules than anyone, as the Zenin family, Gojo family, and Kamo family all decided on what these rules even were together, giving him even more reason to call Suguru out for spouting garbage, adding more weight to him saying that Suguru adding reasoning to Jujutsu sorcery is a habit of the weak, and with Gojo's sorcery of stress being the higher ups, it's even more understandable why he would find anything having to do with Jujutsu regulations to be exhausting. It's also worth noting that Gojo's sentiment about it being exhausting looking out for the weak didn't necessarily change as he got older. As series author Gege Akutami points out, that he still finds it exhausting as he gets older, even if it's not as exhausting as it used to be. When taking their mission from Master Tengen from Yaga, Gojo and Suguru are only told about the existence of one star plasma vessel although there was really more than one star plasma vessel available at the time, although Riko Amanai had the highest potential out of all of them. Tengen merely refused to merge with any of the remaining star plasma vessels and accepted her evolution, basically agreeing to become a threat to all humanity because she figured it was inevitable anyway. This decision had serious repercussions down the line, which caused many of the events in the story that happened later on. When Yaga is explaining their mission, Gojo is the only one that doesn't understand what Tengen's technique is or what's going on. So so Yaga and Suguru explain it to him in detail, with the author pointing out in the fanbook that one of Yaga's main causes of stress is giving Gojo direct orders in person. Although once the mission starts, Gojo doesn't see any need for concern because he and Suguru are the strongest. As a side note, Gege mentions that the first thing that Gojo notices about Suguru is his bangs, which make up his entire first impression of Suguru altogether. Akutami also uses small depictions of Gojo, like adding sunglasses and a speech bubbles when he's younger, to show that he's the one talking when a speech bubble isn't directly next to his face. By the time Gojo is a teenager, he's already famous for his strength, to the point where members of a terrorist group, Q, already know him before he introduces himself. Gojo and Suguru both beat the members of Q that they were up against and are later implied by the author to have possibly been killed after Gojo and Suguru defeated them. After finding Riko Amanai, Gojo wants to take her back to Jujutsu High as quickly as possible, but due to Tengen's orders, Riko Amanai was allowed to stay another day out in the open. This is interesting because it's yet another reason that Tengen's actions led to the domino effect that created the negative circumstances that exist in the Cullen games. When Gojo and Suguru first found Riko Amanai, it was right after Toji created the bounty, before any of the bounty hunters arrived, and before Toji decided that he needed to get involved directly. Meaning that had they taken Riko back to Jujutsu High when Gojo intended to, the mission would have gone far more smoothly than it did, leading to them possibly outpacing Toji and his plans altogether. By the time Toji starts to plan his assassination of the Star Plasma Vessel, he already has a decent handle on Limitless and the Six Eyes. This isn't only due to the encounter that he had with Gojo when they were younger, but also because he's a member of the Zenin Clan, who passes down information about the opposing Gojo and Kamo clans, as Gojo points out later. When Gojo fights one of the bounty hunters that's after Riko Amanai, he instantly takes out two of them with his curse technique, Blue. He then uses the Six Eyes to recognize that none of the clones are Shikigami and that all of them are the real one. Gojo explains his defense as 
something that's similar to Zeno's Paradox, which is a concept from the Greek legend of Achilles and the tortoise, which basically comes down to creating an infinite series of distances between oneself and their opponent. Gojo then tells the bounty hunter directly that he figured out how his technique worked by using the six eyes. Gege Akutami goes into more detail in the fan book, which gives more of an explanation as to what's going on here. The six eyes are noted as allowing the wielder to see curse energy and to have incredibly fine control of curse energy at the same time, allowing Gojo to see through his target's curse technique and detect curse energy. The six eyes are also explained as eyes that can see curse energy extremely clearly. Even when covering his eyes, Gojo has high definition infrared vision, which sees curse energy signatures, where even objects that have no cursed energy can be made out by the flow of cursed energy around them, with the main reason that Gojo covers his eyes being that leaving them uncovered is tiring for him. The glasses that Gojo wears, and presumably the blindfold that he wears later, are so dark that a normal person wouldn't be able to see through them, but Gojo can function with them because of how the six eyes work. After explaining how his infinity defense slows down his enemies, Gojo goes into detail about how his limitless technique lets him create impossible situations like having negative apples, on top of making magnetic effects and huge attraction fields like the one that he used to save Mei and Utahime from their mission. With Akutami's explanation of the technique in the fan book being that anything that approaches the user will continue converging eternally, as the Gojo clan's inherited technique is a barrier that manifests infinity and prevents any contact. An entire jump special was done for all of Gojo's abilities, with multiple pages of extra material on them to figure out the math behind Gojo's techniques, with the end result even when hiring a group of people to help the author being to find someone that's good at math. Gojo then tries to use his reverse technique, Red Glow, but he has no idea how to use reverse techniques at that time, due to not knowing how to use positive energy, so it didn't work. After his mission takes him to Okinawa, Suguru points out that Gojo had been using his curse technique non-stop for two days. In his adult years, this wouldn't have been a problem, but as a teenager, Gojo hadn't learned reverse curse technique, and this kind of overuse could have fried his brain as Shoko points out later on. He also didn't sleep for two days straight either, which he shrugs off due to Suguru's presence. This habit didn't seem to change much with Gojo getting older, as the series author gets asked about it and says that even as a fully grown adult, Gojo still doesn't get much sleep. When Gojo was stabbed from behind by Toji, Toji passed through Jujutsu High's barrier unnoticed because of him not having any cursed energy, while also having a weapon that didn't have any cursed energy as well, to avoid detection from the Six Eyes. Although by reinforcing his body with cursed energy, Gojo was able to stop Toji from dealing any serious damage. An interesting detail to point out here that often gets overlooked is that this means that Gojo is now fighting Toji after two and a half days straight of not sleeping, constantly using his curse technique while having a stab wound that he's unable to heal, which gives the fight between the two more context. In Toji's first fight against Gojo, Toji is able to dodge blue before Gojo can even see him move. Not only is this impressive for Toji blitzing Gojo, but it's also impressive that Toji was the first person ever shown to have dodged blue in the series. Because of Toji not having any cursed energy, Gojo decides to track the cursed spirit wrapped around Toji's body and realizes that Toji is too fast, so he uses his maximum cursed energy output, Azure Glow, which is different from maximum techniques like Suguru's Uzumaki, Jogo's Meteor, and Aso's Wing King. After Toji closes in on Gojo, he stabs him with the inverted Spear of Heaven, which forces the stoppage of cursed techniques on contact, with this being the first time that Gojo's defense was ever shown to be bypassed. Before going further, with the Star Plasma Vessel mission, Gojo and Suguru both agree to take on Tengen themselves if Riko refused the merger, even with Tengen becoming an immortal enemy to humanity. After Gojo and Suguru are beaten by Toji, Gojo's hand begins to twitch, showing that he was still alive. When Gojo returns, he's standing in front of Toji a second time, still in the same bloody ripped up clothes, but now fully healed. When Toji stabbed Gojo in the throat with the inverted Spear of Heaven, Gojo focused everything that he had into reverse curse technique, having figured out how it worked while fighting for his life, by multiplying negative energy together to make positive energy, having understood the core of cursed energy. Gojo was able to do this despite Toji stabbing him with the inverted Spear of Heaven, because Toji dealt what he thought was the finishing blow with a complete different cursed tool, letting Gojo survive long enough to learn how to heal himself over time, while also giving Gojo a scar on his forehead that healed over time as well. After Gojo comes back, he's far stronger and Toji can't even catch him anymore. Having understood how to use positive energy, he can now use his reverse technique, Red Glow, which he failed to do against a bounty hunter earlier, which shoots Toji away with so much force that Toji calls Gojo a monster, 
towards the end of their second fight, Toji figures out a way to deal with all of Gojo's techniques, with Gojo's demeanor giving Toji a sense of uneasiness that he chose to ignore. At this point, Gojo has achieved what many refer to as enlightenment, as he didn't feel any anger or vengeance towards anyone, and declared himself as the honored one throughout heaven and earth. When using purple, Gojo points out that innate techniques are passed down with a manual on how to use them, although word gets out on the techniques, which is how Toji knew so much about Gojo's abilities before fighting him. But even Gojo's Hollow Purple was only known by a few within the Gojo clan itself. Hollow Purple is then called an imaginary mass, which has been interpreted in a number of different ways. Although in an extra bit of information provided by TCB, one of the best translation groups for the manga, it's pointed out that the kanji for Gojo's Hollow Purple uses the same kanji for virtual mass as Yuki's Bombaye, which doesn't erase matter, but instead overloads the technique with so much virtual mass that it can bulldoze its opponents. After beating Toji, Toji claims that Gojo just became the greatest sorcerer alive, with Gege Akutami going out of his way in the fan book to point out that after unlocking reverse curse technique, Gojo reached a divine state with the limitless technique. Before Toji dies, he tells Gojo about his son Megami, who will be sold to the Zenin clan in a couple of years, which Gojo remembers later. After Gojo beats Toji, Suguru isn't only surprised that Gojo is alive, but notices that something is different about his curse energy, which is likely a byproduct of him tapping into the core of curse energy and unlocking reverse techniques. Gojo then questions if he and Suguru should kill all the members of the Time Vessel Association, which the author points out was Gojo using Suguru's moral judgment as a gauge of what was right and wrong as his own principles, with Suguru saying that there should be a reason for using Jujutsu in this kind of way, and Gojo questioning that sentiment, bringing a callback to Gojo and Suguru's conversation before the mission began. After beating Toji, Gojo's defense switches from manual to automatic. He can now automatically slow down objects that approach him based on the intensity of their curse energy, their speed, their mass, and their shape. Although at the time, he hadn't figured out how to do that with poisons. He can almost always have the limitless technique activated at all times using minimal resources, due to using reverse curse technique around the clock to refresh his brain so that it doesn't get fried, which Shoko points out would have fried his brain had he not been able to heal, bringing more context to the exhaustion that he had when facing Toji, off of two and a half days straight of using his curse technique and having no sleep. During this time, Gojo also perfects minimizing hand signs, which gets mentioned later on in his fight against Sukuna, where the concept of subtraction by eliminating unnecessary hand signs is the sign of a skilled sorcerer. He can also use multiple uses of blue and red at the same time, respectively, while having his domain expansion and teleportation to work on before the time skip to volume zero and the next time skip where he meets Yuji. At this point, Suguru recognizes that Gojo has become the strongest, and even with Gojo recognizing that Suguru became depressed, he was unable to stop Suguru's descent into becoming a rogue sorcerer. Yuki Sakumo then arrives and has a conversation with Suguru that leads to him making a plan to wipe out all non-sorcerers on Earth. But Yuki's intention was to meet Gojo instead, meaning that this entire interaction happened by chance, which is only vaguely elaborated on in the manga, but is pointed out in detail in the fanbook. This is also around the same time where Gojo asked Mei to use Bird Strike on him as a part of testing how advanced he became with the Limitless, which may be where he was at the time, which explains Mei's quote in the Shibuya arc about Gojo being the only person to have ever survived bird strike. After confronting Suguru about killing 112 people, his parents, and planning on wiping out every non-sorcerer on the planet, Gojo threatens to kill Suguru, but isn't able to bring himself to take Suguru down due to their past friendship. Suguru also makes a comment about Gojo being able to wipe out every non-sorcerer on the planet if he wanted to. While Gojo and Suguru are still students at this point in time, Gojo's ranking is never mentioned until later in the story. Although with two of the main requirements for special grade being having enough strength to take down special grade curses on a regular basis, on top of being able to bring down a nation by themselves, Toji saying that Gojo is the greatest sorcerer alive, on top of beating someone who can beat special grade curses themselves, and Suguru saying that Gojo Gojo can wipe out every non-sorcerer on the planet, let alone in one nation, heavily implies that Gojo's already at a special grade sorcerer level while he was still a student. It's at this point that Yaga questions why Gojo didn't kill Suguru, and Gojo responds asking Yaga if he's seriously asking him that question, to which Yaga apologizes. Yaga is one of the few Jujutsu High officials that's on good terms with Gojo in his younger years, and one of the few people that understands him, which the author elaborates on when asked. It's at this point that Gojo questions if his own strength is enough, as he can only save those that want to be saved. 
Gege Akutami implies that Gojo had a rough time after Suguru became a rogue curse user, but ultimately pulled himself together after that. Gojo then finds Megami and claims that Megami looks exactly like Toji. After finding out that Megami barely knows or cares about Toji, he learns about Megami and Sumiki's living situation, making them an offer to join the Zenin clan or to join him, to which Megami chooses the latter, becoming Gojo's student, where Gojo tells Megami to work hard and not to get left behind. The author of the series gives more detail on what happened between the 10 years of Megami becoming Gojo's student and Megami officially enrolling in Jujutsu High, saying that Gojo is the one that taught Megami martial arts, along with Maki Zeni. With Gojo often engaging in antics that Megami found to be ridiculous, Gojo would also take a young Megami on missions to give Megami a better understanding of curses in Jujutsu, which would also be where Megami would meet Angel. Gojo also introduced Megami to Mai and Maki Zenin when working out issues between Megami and the Zenin clan. Gojo is also noted as having paid for Sumiki and Megami's living expenses after the money that Sumiki's mother left them ran out, and eventually assigned Megami his first mission when he became a full-fledged student, with the main reason that Gojo even went to meet Megami in the first place being to recruit a talented individual. When Gojo meets Yuta, it's been 10 years after Suguru went rogue. The room that Gojo meets Yuta in when telling him about how he was meant to be executed is the same room that he meets Yuji in one year later when having the same conversation. The reason Yuta was almost attacked by Maki and Umaki and Panda is because Gojo didn't tell any of them that Rika was attached to him and didn't tell Yuta that sorcerers are meant to exercise curses, which is a detail that every party involved looks at Gojo sideways for. When Gojo sends Yuta on his first mission, it's at an elementary school with Maki, a member of the Zenin clan. This is similar to Yuji's first real fight with a cursed spirit being at his high school with Megami, another member of the Zenin clan one year later. Gojo is also the first person that Yuta and Maki see after their mission, the same way that he's the first one Yuji and Megami see after Yuji's first fight with a cursed spirit at his high school. When talking to Yuta about Rika, Gojo claims that a curse like Rika is almost impossible to exercise, while also saying that he would risk his life to exercise her if necessary, implying that Gojo respected Rika's strength even while being the strongest sorcerer on the planet. On Yuta's mission with Inumaki, Gojo tells Yuta not to summon Rika, or else both he and Yuta will be disposed of. Although at this point in the story, there's no one strong enough to kill Gojo on Jujutsu High's side, and no one strong enough to exercise Rika except for Gojo, which is why they turn to him in the first place. The only possible exception for Rika may be being Yuki Sakumo, who already doesn't see eye to eye with the Jujutsu elders to begin with. So if it came down to it, none of the Jujutsu elders would be able to do anything to Yuta or Gojo anyway. Gojo is also the first person to explain cursed speech to Yuta, who understands Gojo's explanation later on when he sees cursed speech firsthand. When Suguru sabotaged Yuta's mission, Gojo recognized that Suguru was involved quickly because he knows Suguru's cursed energy residuals when he sees them. When Gojo threatens to kill Suguru a second time, when Suguru declares war with the Night Parade of 100 Demons, Suguru threatens all of Gojo's students with his cursed spirits. This is a big difference compared to Suguru telling Gojo to kill him if he wants to, the first time that this happened 10 years ago. During the Night Parade of 100 Demons, Gojo is the first person to notice that something is up, because Suguru, not being on the front lines, is out of character, leading to him sending Panda and Inumaki to intercept Suguru, which is one of the catalysts for Yuta bringing out Rika and capitalizing on his potential during the fight with Suguru. Although Gojo's reasons were that he still trusted Suguru to not kill young sorcerers for no reason, with the effect that all of them being beaten by Suguru had on Yuta being a byproduct. In the Night Parade of 100 Demons, Suguru has a special grade cursed tool, Playful Cloud. Playful Cloud is a cursed tool that's owned by the Gojo family, although Suguru hasn't seen Gojo in 10 years by the time the Night Parade starts. So there are three ways that he could have gotten his hands on this weapon. Either one, Gojo handed it to him at some point while they were still students, and Suguru kept it for all that time. Or two, Suguru bought the weapon from somewhere after it fell into someone else's hands. Or three, Suguru found it entirely on his own during the 10 year time skip. The curse rope that Miguel uses against Gojo to disrupt Gojo's curse technique isn't a special grade curse tool, but instead is something that's on par with one. It goes into the same category as weapons as Maharaga's Sword of Extermination, that one shots cursed spirits, with both of them being considered to be divine instruments rather than cursed tools with a specific grade. The curse rope took Miguel's village decades to make and still wasn't replenished a year later by the culling games. Gojo then compares Miguel to MMA comedian Bobby Olagun, who's a fighter from Nigeria that had several of his matches in Japan. When Gojo uses his reverse technique, Red, 
Miguel points out that Gojo's Limitless works by controlling space on an atomic level, meaning that it likely attacks its targets on an atomic level as well, all of which is made possible by the Six Eyes. When Gojo has his last meeting with Suguru, he says something that doesn't get shown directly in their conversation. Although Gege Akutami points out that what Gojo said to Suguru is also mentioned in Gojo's conversation with Yuta after the night parade ended, telling Suguru that he was his best friend and his one and only. After looking into Yuta's lineage, Gojo tells Yuta that they're both descendants of Michizane Sugawara, one of the big three vengeful spirits of Japan. Over a thousand years ago, during the Heian period, where Jujutsu sorcery was at its peak, a group of families rose to prominence among Jujutsu sorcerers. These were called the Three Noble Houses, and are known today as the Big Three Families of Jujutsu. The Gojo family descended from Sugawara no Michizane. The Gojo family then passed down the Limitless Curse technique, while also passing down the Six Eyes, both of which tend to skip generations, although Gojo ended up with both. When the Night Parade of Demons ends, Yuta is seen in a jacket, and in the Volume Zero movie, he shows eating with Miguel. The author of the series points out that this is because Gojo tracked Miguel down and threatened him into training Yuta. This training lasted a year until Yuta later returned during the Shibuya arc. When Gojo meets Yuji, he's able to tell that Yuji and Sukuna merged with his six eyes. Some believe that this means that Gojo can see the soul, while others believe that it's because of how detailed the six eyes are at seeing cursed energy. When Gojo tells Yuji about his planned execution, it's in the same room that he spoke to Yuta in when they first met who was also set to be executed for having vengeful spirit Rika Orimoto attached to him. During his conversation with Yuji about his execution, Gojo says that the Jujutsu elders are cowards and want to kill Yuji right away. Gege Akutami expands on this by saying that the Jujutsu elders are Gojo's main source of stress, which is interesting based on how the elders came to be in the first place. When expanding on the Jujutsu Kaisen universe, Gege Akutami writes that the Jujutsu headquarters are established in the Japanese government as the highest institution to regulate Jujutsu sorcerers. The Jujutsu headquarters are appointed by the Prime Minister of Japan, based on nominations from the Zenin family, the Gojo family, and the Kamo family. With Gojo being the head of the Gojo clan, it's possible that he may have had something to do with the process of getting some of the Jujutsu elders into power, even if he was against them being elected and the other two families outnumbered him in a voting process. Although with how old the Jujutsu elders are to begin with, it's completely possible that all of them were elected before Gojo became the Gojo clan head, which would drive him even more to want to replace them altogether. When feeding Yuji one of Sukuna's fingers in Chapter 2, Yuji briefly has flashes of becoming Sukuna, and Gojo is ready to kill him if necessary. Gojo also points out that he believes Sukuna, who's living inside of Yuji, will serve as a detector for finding the rest of Sukuna's fingers, which the author points out that Gojo was wrong about, as Sukuna's main plan wasn't about gathering his fingers. With Gojo agreeing to make Yuji his student for the same reason that he did with Yuta Akotsu. They're strong, and he doesn't care about the rest of the details. When Gojo gets challenged by Sukuna in Chapter 3, he's confident that he would beat Sukuna even at Sukuna's full strength. The author, Gege Akutami, points out in the fan book that Gojo is more feared in his era than Sukuna was in the past, although this isn't because of a strength difference. In the Heian era, where Sukuna was in his prime, the sorcerers and cursed spirits were more vicious than they are today, with Gojo being born into a generation that doesn't have that same mindset. When Yuji, Megami, and Nobara are sent on a mission to take down a special grade finger bear, Ajichi points out that this would normally be a mission for Gojo, but he's away on a business trip. The author expands on this by saying, Saying that Gojo was sent to clean up a situation where a grade 1 sorcerer went missing on a mission, so they sent Gojo there as a special grade sorcerer since he would be strong enough to handle it. After Yuji is seemingly killed on his mission, Gojo recognizes that the entire situation was orchestrated by the higher ups as a plot to kill Yuji by sending Gojo's team after a special grade while he was away. This and Gojo's confrontation with Gakuganji after Yuji was proven to be alive is one of the main reasons for the friction between Gojo and Gakuganji. As Gege Akutami points out that when refuting Yuji's execution, Gojo's ego pushed Gakuganji over the edge, as not everyone agreed with Gojo's decision to have Itadori consume all 20 fingers before being executed. Shoko Ieri is also in the room when Gojo says he wants to kill all the higher-ups, but Shoko doesn't have any particular alignment when it comes to being with the higher-ups or against them. She simply sides with whoever she's closest with at the time. Kenjaku, a sorcerer from 1000 years ago, who already fought two Six Sides users in the past, 
cast, thinks that the only way for his plan to succeed is for Gojo to be removed from the fight entirely and to have Sukuna on his side. Gojo also points out that he believes that Yuji, Yuta, and Hikari all have the potential to rival him in the future, and that all of them play into his ultimate goal of fostering strong, clever allies. When Gojo is tracked down by Jogo, he compares Jogo to Sukuna in strength. While some people think that this is comparing Jogo to Three Finger Sukuna because that's how strong Sukuna was at that point in the story, this is actually comparing Jogo to the One Finger Sukuna that Gojo fought himself, which is shown in the flashback. He also explains his curse technique to Jogo, which is a trope called showing one's hand that increases the power of Gojo's curse technique, which is something that many people overlook in Gojo and Jogo's fight. When Gojo is training Yuji on how to channel his curse energy, he has Yuji watch several different movies while holding a cursed corpse that will punch Yuji if his flow of curse energy is disturbed. The movies that Gojo has Yuji watch are Leon the Professional, The Descendant, The Host, The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On, and The Deep Blue Sea, the last of which Gojo spoiled for Yuji before having him watch the film. When hitting Jogo with his domain expansion, Unlimited Void, Gojo compares his own domain which floods targets with infinite sets of information to the point where they can't even move, to being given everything and being able to do nothing. This is possibly a reference to Gojo's own inability to stop Suguru from going rogue, despite him being the strongest sorcerer on the planet. In Chapter 18, Gojo tells Gakuganji that the new generation won't be limited to special grade, with Suguru's Night Parade of 100 Demons happening a year before and Yuji appearing as the Vessel of Sukuna, basically telling Gakuganji that the days of the higher-ups are numbered. When Nanami meets Mahito in Chapter 21, Mahito says that he's lucky that Gojo hadn't shown up because Gojo is too strong, yet Nanami is strong enough to experiment on without being completely out of Mahito's range, with Nanami even comparing Mahito to Gojo because of both of them having a ton of power with a superficial nature. The reason that Gojo brings Yuji straight to Gakuganji during the Kyoto Exchange event is because of the higher-ups involvement in the planned death of Itadori Yuji, who was still alive, so Gojo wanted to rub it in Gakuganji's face. This would lead to Gakuganji coming up with yet another plan to kill Yuji during the exchange event involving a semi-grade 1 cursed spirit, and the entire Kyoto squad, with the exception of Toto. But ultimately, the plan fell through, and Yuji survived to the end. When Hanami and the rest of Kenjaku's invasion squad crashed the Kyoto exchange event, the curtain used during the event is specifically used to keep Gojo on the outside. This is done to distract him from their real objective of sending Mahito to the Jujutsu storeroom to retrieve the death paintings and six of Sukuna's fingers. During one of he and Megami's training sessions, Gojo has a well-known quote saying that no matter how many allies you surround yourself with, you'll always die alone. This may sound like a contradiction, as Gojo has stated on more than one occasion that his goal is fostering strong intelligent allies, but when looking at it more closely, it isn't. Gojo is essentially telling Megami to become as strong as possible at all costs. While Gojo's goal of gathering allies has less to do with his own survival and more to do with changing the Jujutsu world on a fundamental level, two different goals that require two different methods. When Kokichi Muta brings out Ultimate Mechamaru, one of his plans was to call in Gojo to deal with Kenjaku and Mahito, although due to Kenjaku's curtain, the signal for cell reception was blocked leading to Kokichi being killed by Mahito. When Jogo, Hanami, and Choso gather to fight Gojo 3-on-1 in Shibuya, Choso is visibly the least interested out of the group. This is pointed out by Gege Akutami as being because Choso had no reason to risk his life to seal Gojo in the first place. And during the fight in Shibuya, Gojo still dominated the disaster curses despite them filling the area with civilians so that he couldn't use his strongest techniques, which would kill the civilians around him, limiting him to very limited applications of his cursed energy, like blowing up Hanami in a 0.2 second domain expansion to kill Mahito's transfigured humans. When Gojo gets sealed by Prison Realm, his six eyes aren't able to recognize that Kenjaku isn't really Suguru, but because of him killing Suguru with his own hands, Gojo knows that something is up. It's revealed later that because Gojo didn't completely destroy every trace of Suguru's body, Kenjaku was able to take Suguru over and make his body his own, which Kenjaku coveted due to Suguru's technique. Along with Kenjaku believing that Gojo is too strong and Kenjaku's own words. Before he's completely sealed away, Gojo calls out to Suguru, whose body reacts after hearing Gojo's words. Gojo, ironically, is the last voice that Suguru heard before his death, and the first voice that sprung his body into action after it was taken over, even if only temporarily, with Gojo being sealed being the sign that it was all over for all the humans in the country of Japan to Kento Nanami. In an interview with Mondo Kobayashi, Gege Akutami mentions that Gojo and his abilities were too strong, making him a hindrance to the story. 
so he sealed him away. While inside of Prison Realm, Gojo notes that time doesn't pass on the inside, with Prison Realm still needing time to process him after he was sealed. Tengen is also noted as having the back half of Prison Realm, which if nullified, can lead to Gojo being released. Although Gojo either sealed the inverted Spear of Heaven, which would have been capable of doing this, or destroyed it, along with exhausting the entire supply of Miguel's Black Rope during their fight with the Night Braid of 100 Demons, which could have freed him from Prison Realm as well. Gojo is also mentioned when Nabito implies that he's happy about Gojo being sealed, as he wants to see the fall of the Gojo clan, with Nabito's main source of stress being listed as the Gojo family. While he was sealed, Gojo was marked as an accomplice to Suguru Geto and exiled from the Jujutsu world, and anyone that tried to unseal him would be marked as a criminal, with every single execution that Gojo being around would have stopped being set back in motion after he was sealed, which led to Yuta faking Yuji's death as Gojo contacted him beforehand, telling him to watch over Yuji and the rest of his students if anything ever happened to him. Gojo was later unsealed in chapter 221, after having Angel, a sorcerer from the past, use Jacob's ladder on the back of Prison Realm, a technique of hers that nullifies barriers and curse techniques. Before unsealing Gojo, Angel was concerned that he may have gone insane due to the passage of time not flowing normally inside of Prison Realm, making it possible that he may have felt like he was waiting for 100 years. Before his with Sukuna, Gojo was told that all of the humans that were affected by his domain expansion in Shibuya have been rehabilitated back into society, and that the remnants of his curse energy stopped any curses from ever approaching BF5 the area where he was sealed, for the entire two months between his sealing and the day of his fight with Sukuna. The day of the fight being December 24th, as Gojo plans on killing Kenjaku the same day that he fights Sukuna, to give Suguru's body a proper burial. Gojo then has the higher-ups killed now that his goal of fostering strong clever allies has become real, and recommends Gaku Ganji as the new leader of Jujutsu headquarters, which because of Gojo being head of the Gojo family is actually within his power to do. Gojo does this in in spite of Gakuganji killing Yaga because of him realizing that Gakuganji was simply following orders, and recognizing that Gakuganji has changed after hearing that he didn't tell the other higher-ups about the secret behind Panda's creation. Gojo then partners up with Ijichi, Utahime, and Gakuganji to use hand signs, gestures, chants, dances, and music to power up his hollow purple against Sukuna, in a battle known as the strongest of the past versus the strongest of today, using his own chants and hand movements that he didn't use when following hollow purple at the Kyoto Exchange event or against Toji. This takes Gojo's hollow purple to 200% of its strength, which he fires at a full power Sukuna who survives, marking the start of their fight. Gojo is also listed as the main source of stress for five different people by Gege Yakutami, and until Jujutsu Kaisen expands, that is everything that you didn't know about Gojo.